In this series, we're going to look at wall paintings from elite houses. And I thought it might be useful to start with a drawing of how such a house was built and organized. This is another plan from Yves Dambra's book, Roman Art. What you would see here is a plan around two courtyards. The first is really not a courtyard. It's called an atrium with an open ceiling. And it is entered through the vestibule that opens on the street. And each morning when the gate would be open and left open, and the clients of the person who lived in this rather grand house would come to visit and pay their respects and do some business. Usually it was taking out loans, uh, paying off loans, talking about politics in the town or in a uh, larger region, asking for favors, giving favors, all the things that a community of people would do around a leader who had a responsibility to them as patron to clients. And all of that business would be done in the atrium, which here is number two, and in D, the tablinium, which is kind of public room or living room of the house, through which you would enter into the courtyard, which here is a peristyle courtyard. That is, it has a line of columns all the way around it and is marked out, and the roof is supported by those columns. You'll see a picture of a peristyle courtyard later on, or atrium, actually. It's an atrium in this lecture. What you're seeing here in the house is that it has a set of rooms. All the rooms that are marked E are called cubicula, and each of them could be used as a bedroom or a living quarters, a meeting room, any kind of thing. They're just the sort of ordinary rooms of the house. The triclinium, which is G, is actually the dining room, and the ally, as it's called, which is B, off of the atrium, is a kind of pantry, like a butler's pantry, from which they would serve food to the people who were visiting. You enter a garden in the back, and we'll see a picture later on of a garden that would be entered. Here is number four, and you would enter it from the courtyard and then pass through it into the backyard, so to speak. It's a fairly simply structured house. You would have found this throughout the Roman towns, everywhere. The upper classes would live in houses like this. Very efficient, and for the kind of weather that they had, very effective. The walls of these elite houses were covered in paintings, and we'll see a whole variety of them here. Here you have the figure of Narcissus from Greek mythology. He's gazing at his reflection in the pool. Remember that he was turned into a water flower for his excessive self-regard. The Romans were not prudish, as we've seen in the earlier lectures, and you would see on these walls nudes and also what we would regard as pornography, sexual scenes. In rooms that were public and rooms that were private, it mattered not at all. People who would put nude statues of themselves in their houses, in the public portions of their houses, were not squeamish about putting all kinds of physical behavior up on their walls, and they did so. This is particularly true, by the way, in the public baths, some of which have walls full of various sexual acts. But in any case, this is a nice example of a wall painting on one of these cubicular walls that we saw in the last slide. This shows you another type of wall painting or decoration. It's a realistic scene of an entertainment at the party. The room's walls serve to remind those living there that they were socially important and they went to and through parties. These pictures were reminders to those who visited that this was a prominent family that participated in the social life of the town. And here we have a woman who is playing a cithra with a servant behind her. And a scene like this painted on the wall, aside from the fact that the wall was painted so elaborately and richly to start with, a scene like this announced uh, to visitors that the owner was a member of the social elite. Romans painted what might be called landscapes, I suppose, on their walls. But notice these landscapes are quite different from what we've seen in the Chinese case. These are scenes, really, of human activity, building activities. Here we have a bridge. We have cattle herding. We have farming. We have what looks like fishing or some kind of shipping in the background and large temple-like buildings. You would find this kind of scene in many places, on many walls, in Roman houses. They are pastoral scenes for the most part, and quite differentiated from what the Chinese were doing. In the Chinese case, as you remember, nature predominates, and the human and animal role in nature or place in nature is minimized. In the Roman case, it's the opposite. Nature appears only as a setting for human activities. 
We've seen painting to date that makes the room prettier, more interesting to be in, that has a social purpose in the sense of reminding visitors of the social prominence of the family and so on. Here what we see, is, and we'll see a whole series of these, is a type of painting which is designed to give the room a great deal more grandeur than the actual architecture contains. We have an architectural setting here with the statuary in it. People are heroic people. Nudes are in this scene observing the people who look like they're coming out of a grand portal. Behind them is a statue in a niche. This may be a depiction of the owners uh, of the house, the family of the house coming out of that portal. It enhances the grandeur of the room and, of course, the grandeur of the people themselves. This is a work that comes from the same house as the one we just were looking at. Indeed, you can see that we're on a corner of the wall because the painting on the left side of the wall is the one we've just been looking at, whereas on the other wall we see another scene that is more casual in certain ways, but is also framed in this big architectural structure that's painted there. You can see that below there are panels of faux marble. This is basically a plaster room, but they did a lot of work to represent marble and metals in their painting, give that whole wall a much different feel as if it were sumptuous polished marble. The room is decorated all together to appear to be more than it is. And one of the things that we've already seen in portraiture is that the Romans are forever striving to present a public image of themselves that's uh, grander than they in fact are themselves. There's a striving for grandeur in this society and we see it in the portraiture and we see it in their houses and particularly on the walls of their houses. Here is elaborately painted walls from a house called the Villa of Mysteries. The reason it's called the Villa of Mysteries is because many of these wall paintings depict mystery cults. The mystery cults, as you'll learn, were Eastern religious cults as the Eastern Mediterranean was conquered, came into the empire and spread to the West. And at one point, Christianity was regarded by the Romans to be one of the mystery cults. The characteristic of almost all of these was that they initiated their members into a secret knowledge and then performed various kinds of sacrifices and other rituals that were designed to save the initiates from the vicissitudes of life and of the world. And so they promised a salvation in much the same way that Christianity does. And these various pictures on the walls portray various of the rituals of these cults. Many of the upper class actually belong to more than one. They hedge their bets. Here you have a wonderful example of painted architecture, a very common form of painting on the walls. You saw architectural elements in some of the earlier things that we looked at, but here the whole purpose is to create an architecture in the architecture, so to speak, a painting of the architecture that enhances and transforms the actual architecture of the building and the room. You see a doorway set into a vestibule supported by columns, very grand. Above the doorway are openings, which are essentially windows that can be looked through in the center to some kind of a fountain that's high up, high enough so that you can see it over the door. And then, of course, to the left, you have somebody looking in. Windows go both ways, and it looks like somebody's taking a look. And also, on the right side, an elderly gent looking in. You can also see, on both sides of the columns, a kind of elaborate standard made of metal. And it shows that the Romans could make very elaborate and exquisite metal work. And we'll see some of that as well in later pictures. Here the painted architecture is used to create dramatic effect. What you're looking at is kind of a representation of the stage house of a theater, which was in several levels. And here you have the balcony and the openings above. And what that does is it creates in this wall a kind of suspense, an expectation that something's about to happen. Somebody's going to pop out on one of those balconies and make a speech or something or play some role in a play. So you have a wall as a theater scene made here. And you can see that in the lower registers, what you have are paintings on painting. That is to say, you have a representation of what we would hang on the wall. But here it's just actually painted on the wall. The center one is a scene of Bacchus, the god of wine, and Ariadne, and he is saving her. This is not his usual behavior, but in this particular story, he saves her from distress, and it's represented here. There are 
two metal, very elaborate metalwork easels on either side with paintings on them. Again, painting on painting, and uh, again, it shows the elaborate and exquisite metalwork that the Romans could do and could represent in their paintings. But this is a nice example of a theater wall. We're looking into the corner of a room. This is the house of T. Fanius Sinistor. Bus Coriale is close to Pompeii. This house was among those buried in 79 CE when Mount Vesuvius exploded. And this is a decoration that creates a whole series of architectural fantasies. It's almost as if you're looking out upon these fantasies, these elaborate and fanciful buildings that show what architecture in the imagination could be. And so here what your walls do is not present an interior like the doorway that we saw or a stage presence as in the theater wall that we saw, but rather almost as if it were a series of windows looking out. It expands the room in a way by having these kinds of decorations on the walls. This is the same room. Now we're really looking down its length. It's a cubiculum, one of those little rooms, made to feel much larger by the paintings, particularly the way these are done. You can see the corner, which was off to the right there, behind this bench or whatever it is, that piece of furniture that's there, that we were just looking at. But you can also see that as you sweep your eyes to the left, there's a window, which is actually a painted window. I believe it's a painted window, at least it looks like that to me from here. But what you can see is how this room would have looked in its entire aspect. And in some cases, by the way, the scenes would have gone right up onto the ceiling and it gets kind of overwhelming. But in this case, the decorator left the ceiling in simple color and that enhances what he or she did on the walls. So when you go out through the exedra into the garden, this is the kind of garden you would find. It's usually an enclosed garden, very symmetrical in its organization highly ordered fountain in the center and as you'll see in the next slide often had sort of picnic areas set out where the family could eat outdoors. This is a complete contrast to the Chinese garden which was a made chaos. It was human made but it was made to look as if it were natural whereas the Romans wanted their gardens to be contained and in this case you have a peristyle surrounding. You can see the line of columns which mark out the boundary and hold up the porticos around this garden so that this is a kind of cloister interior garden that gives privacy, quiet, and out-of-doors experience without getting too wild about it. In this last slide of this series, we're looking at another garden scene. In this case, this is the eating area, picnic area in a garden, uh, another garden in Pompeii. We are very lucky in some ways that the Pompeians were so unlucky because Vesuvius exploded the way Mount St. Helens did a couple of decades ago now and buried these cities in ash which preserved them and in some cases buried them under 100 feet of the stuff. Another side of the mountain had a little town that looks just like La Jolla overlooking the bay, a beautiful place called Herculaneum and Herculaneum was buried by mud that came down the mountain and flowed into the houses and preserved even in some cases the wood by sealing it away from the air. But Pompeii was buried in ash. And the people were killed by heat and by the poisonous gases that rushed down the mountain. When a mountain like that explodes, the force of the explosion drives down the mountain a superheated air mass of poisonous gases that can be traveling at almost the speed of sound. It's quite remarkable. And anything in its path will be leveled. Pompeii was far enough away so that it had somewhat dissipated by the time it reached here, but it was still moving very quickly and it killed everything in its pathway and killed it so fast that town was essentially deserted in a very short time. What we see here then is an outdoor garden area. It's been built over and protected by the archaeologists, but you can get a sense, I think, of um, what a pleasant area it was to have a an evening meal.